what the hell is a DCF valuation? Well, first of all, the fact is, you know, the numbers are a discounted cash flow valuation means two things. Essentially, think about it this way. Let's say that we are trying to sell your farm and you're trying to figure out, okay, how much should I ask for my farm? I have no idea, right? And then you come up with two methods, which are both in this DCF, actually. One method would be to actually calculate how much money the farm will generate over the course of its useful life, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, right? Add it all up, discount it to today, because, you know, we'll explain in a second, the money isn't worth today what it's worth in 30 years, right? Because a dollar today isn't the same dollar in 1975. Think about it this way, right? The other valuation would be to see how much farms in the area are selling for, at least comparable farms, and basically say, well, if this farm is similar to mine and they just sold for XYZ, my farm is probably worth about XYZ, right? There's two methods to do it. Both of them I'm going to use in this format. And how exactly does this work? Well, first of all, we're calculating the EBITDA. And EBITDA is essentially the earnings before income tax, depreciation, and amortization, meaning how much I generated minus gross profit, minus operation expenses, but not minus DNA, depreciation, amortization. That stays in. I'll explain a second why. Then we're taking out the DNA. Now, why am I subtracting depreciation and amortization? The reason I'm subtracting it because this is not a cash flow item. This is a made up number. It doesn't mean anything. It's just there for tax purposes. Let me explain why. Because when my tax liability is set, it's not fair to tax me without taking into account how much value, for example, my phone lost or my car lost or my tractor or the every capital investment I have is depreciating over time. Well, excluding land, for example, but most of the stuff you own depreciate over time, right? As the years goes by, it becomes older and older and it's worth less outside of collectibles, probably, right? So depreciation and amortization are basically two ways to give me a tax benefit on the loss of value on my stock, whether they're tangible or intangible. Depreciation is for tangibles, amortization is for non-tangibles. So I take it out and then I calculate my tax liability without the DNA, just so I know how much I should be taxed for without these actual items, because I want to get the tax benefit to reflect the loss of value of my stuff. Then I add them back because it's still real money. Then I actually apply the tax. I reduce CapEx. CapEx is essentially how much I invested. I mean, I invest cash in developing my business. I build factories, I buy new tractors, I buy stuff for my farm, you know? So I'm investing in capital for my uh, business, right? That has to be reduced because it reduces the cash flow. Then it's a very simplistic model. I get a free cash flow. Now that free cash flow has to be discounted to today. Why? Well, because if I give you a million dollars today, in five years, you can put that million dollar in the bank and you're gonna have much more than one billion million, sorry, <laughs> shows you where my mind is, right? Or you can go to the stock market, invest 1 million, probably make 5 million in five years, the way this market is going. So money today is worth less than money in the future because you can actually invest it and make money. So how do you reflect that? Well, the way you reflect that, and again, it's a very simplistic explanation. The way you reflect it is basically by using what is we call the WAC. Now, WAC is essentially the weighted average cost of capital. Essentially, we look to reflect the risk and how much you can actually generate over the course of the next five years by looking at how much capital costs you. Now, of course, there's two types of capital. One is debt and one is equity, right? The debt is easy to understand. I mean, it's basically the interest rates in the banks. Right now, it's zero. So the more debt you have, your whack goes down. <laughs> and of course, the equity also has a price. Your investors expect to get a return. Their expectation is the cost of capital on your equity. So you have to balance it out by the amount of equity you have versus the amount of debt you have. And then you calculate this formula that I'm not going to do here, but essentially you get a number that shows what your whack is. Essentially, whack is how much money you can generate from putting this $5 million back to today, bringing it back to today, how much money you can generate in five years, four years, three years, whatever. Very, very simplistic uh, explanation. It's supposed to reflect risk as well. That is why even though we have a 0% interest rate now in the bank, I'm still going to use 10% for this company because for SaaS companies, and this is what I call a classic SaaS company in cybersecurity, 10% is the way to go. It's kind of a standard thing. Now, once I brought back the money, that's not it, because look at this number here. We're all the way to 2026. Is this company going out of business in 2027? No, it will not. So what happens then? 
then you see this part called perpetual growth valuation on the bottom on the left side. That is how much the company will grow every year to eternity. <laughs> and that's why we use 4 to 5%, not more, because the company will definitely not grow indefinitely. But because we're doing a perpetual kind of hypothesis, you know, of this perpetual growth, we're going to use only 5% just to reflect inflation and just a little bit more, not a lot. And then we're going to take this number basically showing us the long-term perpetual growth, going to bring it back to today and then create what we call a present value of the terminal value. And to that, we're going to add how much cash we have versus how much debt we have in order to reflect the assets we currently have, or at least the difference in assets. And then we're going to divide it by the amount of shares we have and get an actual value at target price for the share. Now, while we do that, there's another way to do it, which is called the multiplier system, where you take the year five, basically EBITDA, and you use a multiplier that is applicable for that industry to get a number, which you kind of bring it back to today from 2026. That is kind of where most people are as far as, you know, investment bankers and analysts, they tend to gravitate more towards the multiplier system because it's more realistic than, you know, a perpetual endless growth and whatnot at a very low rate. But eventually what I like to do in my DCF is actually use both. And of course, in this multiplier method, you also have to add the cash and deduct the amount of debt you have in order to reflect the current assets. And again, the number gets divided by the amount of shares and you get a target price. Now, I actually do both. I average them out and the average is my target price. 